On October 12th, the European Central Bank released an academic paper titled The Distributional Consequences of Bitcoin. Introduction and conclusion is 22 pages long. The abstract's most interesting line states, if the price of Bitcoin rises for good, the existence of Bitcoin impoverishes both non-holders and latecomers. We'll primarily focus in on that as I provide some uncensored rebuttal that you just won't get anywhere else. And don't worry, I'll keep the gloves on. I can play nice. Sometimes. It's Sir Ulrich, and are you down with the underground? Now, before we get started, Coin Icarus has his own rebuttal from last week. Be sure to check his out in the link above. Now, we all know the EU is on the verge of collapse and can't have this non state digital money take away its economic sovereignty. <laughs> How will the bureaucrats send their offspring to private school? So Jurgen Schaff and Ulrich Benzel wrote this paper. And I gotta say, it's politically motivated. It's self-preservation motivated. You know, when survival instincts kick in, you'll do the same thing as any old politician. You'll just flat out lie. Now, while I can't touch every point in this video, I will try to address some critical ones. Starting with the introduction, Quote, even 16 years after its inception, real Bitcoin payments, i.e. effectively on-chain, are still cumbersome, slow, and expensive. Wrong. On-chain is the settlement layer and Bitcoin settlement takes place every 10 minutes. How long does settlement take for the dollar or euro? Well, bank transfers, which are ACH and SEPA respectively, wire transfers, credit card settlements all take one to three days. Payments by check take two to five days. Now there are some real time payments for dollar and euro, that's RTP and target two respectively, and those are immediate, but they have to have a minimum of at least a million dollars, sometimes several million. So like always, unless you're ultra wealthy, you don't benefit from the fiat system. And these two easily lose this argument. The Bitcoin layer one was never meant to be for fast transactions. It was meant to be a reliable, stable, and secure settlement layer and it's still providing uh, services that are almost 150 times faster than the settlement that we have now in the fiat system and cheaper too. You can check out the mempool to see for yourself all the other details about transaction costs and speed. And then right after that, they quote themselves from two years ago saying Bitcoin has never been used to a significant extent for legal real world transactions. Well, one, what the hell is a significant extent? And two, what the hell is a legal real world transaction? Well, it happens to be one of these. So let's see, number one, yes, two, yes, three, definitely, four, yep, five, yes, six, yes, even though governments convert to their local fiat at the time of the transaction. There are other subcategories, but I just think these two deep state lackeys are seemingly throwing out buzzwords and hope that no one cross references them and people just hopefully nod in unison. So that was just the introduction of their academic paper. In section 2.1, they quote the introduction of the white paper where they say these costs and payment uncertainties can be avoided in person by using physical currency, but no mechanism exists to make payments over a communication channel without a trusted party. Then it goes on to say, and this is a long one, but I'm gonna read it to you anyways, it's important. The problem that Nakamoto believes to have identified seems, however, to start from a misunderstanding. In principle, financial institutions can avoid mediating disputes. Mediation is rather an optional service and a necessity. It is deemed by customers and charged by payment service providers. And for example, PayPal does not offer any dispute mediation if payments are made in the friends and family mode. And these are free of charge. Likewise, credit transfers between bank accounts are not mediated, i.e. if an e-commerce delivery is paid in advance via credit transfer and the customer is unsatisfied with the good received, the bank will not mediate. I mean, this is like, oh, hey, I'm PayPal. You can play in my walled garden. I promise I won't interfere or block you or anything like that. Trust me. Oh, hello, I'm the Bank of Canada. I won't freeze your bank account as long as you wear a mask by yourself in your car. And oh, and take this injection. <laughs> you know, these mobsters are so drunk on their authority, they don't even realize when no means no. 
it's not about speed or fancy tech. It's about having real authority over your own actions. And if you have admin rights over my actions, then you are the mediator, whether active or passive. Bitcoin doesn't need you, Ulrich. I say this 10 times before I go to bed every night. In section 2.2, they tell the world how it should value something. Assets are typically anchored in a future income or utility stream. Most assets generate regular cash flows, e.g. real estate yields, a rent, shares pay dividends, and bonds pay interest. Based on the present and expected future cash flows, the present value of such an asset can be calculated. I mean, these people are flat out propagandists. Does gold generate a yield? Does the home you own and live in yield a rent? Does a growth stock pay a dividend? Does a classic car under a tarp provide cash flows? No, no to all of these. But note, none of these things threaten to make these two and their puppet masters obsolete. First question you must ask is, why should anything have an alleged fair value estimation? There's nothing more fair than an open free market. Whereas many people get together and determine what they would buy something at. We got to stop thinking that getting a college education gives you some divine insight into how the world works. Now, if anything, it clouds your judgment by elevating the value of information from the institution and minimizing the information you get from the real world. These European academics are seething because they didn't figure out how to value something new and others figured it out how to do it before them. And they still doubt its potential. If they did finally wake up, they would just shut the hell up, take some of that cantillionaire money and buy some Bitcoin for themselves. But their egotism just won't let them in. In section 2-3, they're already in a lengthy cope session because people want to highlight Bitcoin's digital scarcity and the analogy to gold. Quotes Bitcoin finance personalities like Larry Fink, Kathy Wood, Marty Bent, but then highlight celebrities like Ashton Kutcher and Tom Brady as if to minimize Bitcoin as a simple pop culture fad. As if Bitcoin is anything like pop culture. And I live in the pop culture center of Los Angeles and these zombies around me can't tell the difference between Bitcoin and Roblox Robux. Now one quote stood out to me where he said, Larry Fink skips an attempt to explain why Bitcoin has value as a means of payment. Well, yeah, of course he skips it. He's under the same statutes of public speaking limitations as Michael Saylor after Bitcoin crossed 30K. And they were like, no, Mike, you can't talk about self-custody anymore. You're going to ruin us. It's clear neither Michael Saylor nor Larry Fink are allowed to say certain things lest they too quickly disrupt the international rules-based order. But that's just another topic entirely. But I digress. Value as a means of payment is all about permission. What is the value of someone not being able to tell you no? Do you really want to know? I'll, I'll tell you right now. Go ahead and turn on your phone, check what the price of Bitcoin is today. And that's your answer. And check again in five years. I bet it will be even higher. In section 2.4 titled The Investment Vision, they say in contradiction to the initial vision of Bitcoin as being independent from legal and governance interference, legislation and legal recognition are crucial for the prospects of Bitcoin. Look, I know it's hard to believe, but Bitcoin is truly open source. You know, the applications people use because of simplicity and marketing, it's made it appear like governments can just turn off Bitcoin. But there's just no way to halt the use of Bitcoin software without around the clock surveillance on every computing device connected to the internet. Those top of funnel applications, the ones that go through the regulatory ringer, they expose themselves to such exercises for the sake of profit. And you can't blame them. We all have our incentives, but those open source software apps that are made free and available, they can't be halted. However, your reward for making such products are generally less monetarily lucrative. Now, the section continues to discuss how crypto businesses have moved into courting politicians and major branding partnerships. <laughs> so like Gillette should be investigated because the shaving product wants to have their name on a stadium. 
or Ball Aerospace. They have naming rights in Denver. They sh are they overstepping their bounds? They should just stick to aerospace, right? You know, Bitcoin itself, Bitcoin's not doing this marketing. It's individuals with their own personal incentives. The fiat world is used to being able to assault or address or coerce the head of a snake. There just isn't enough propaganda or censorship to take on every participant in the network, and it's driving people crazy. Section 3 attempts to give a lesson in Keynesian economics, and it's absolutely saturated with consumption-centric theory. One quote we see, new technologies are pivotal to growth and the increase of welfare of society. So I'll say, you know, the Keynesian devil, the Keynesian devil will trick you to make necessity for growth to be axiomatic or self-evident. And it's not. Anyone who tells you this is flawed or lying. Economic productivity can occur without endless expansion. In fact, Endless expansion is impossible because we live in a finite world. Why do people buy into this? They talk about two effects, the productivity effect and the wealth effect. As productivity becomes more efficient uh, for all society to use, society essentially benefits. And for the wealth effect, as people consume more in society uh, because of investment in prosperous assets or companies, uh, society benefits as well. So they place Bitcoin on this productivity wealth matrix and they essentially claim Bitcoin has the wealth effect but without any productivity effect which they use as a complaint and they say is a bane to society. But you know the egotism of the fiat system they presume that the monetary technology they use they own uh, is sufficient. But Bitcoin, Bitcoin places the productivity effect on money itself as the most optimal form of savings, a cheaper medium of exchange for vendors, and the most honest unit of account we could ever have. But this is why major central banks will neither buy nor promote Bitcoin. It would essentially sign their own death note. It would indicate that people like that Ulrich and Jurgen are no longer needed. Imagine a snake given a choice between eating its own tail and fighting to the death. I think the snake would rather fight to the death. And that's what you're seeing with this ECB paper. Then there's this wall of coping as they try to address alleged bubble assets. And they say they emerge where there's no alternative fundamentally driven asset that has better yield than the bubble assets. Well, have they tried reconsidering their Keynesian fundamentals? Then they say that rational traders stay in an irrational bubble market longer than they should, contributing to an elongated bubble. Well, maybe the question should be, what biases do you hold to not see the value that these traders do? It's so funny, these central bankers with their horse blinders on, they just don't realize that money should never have been in control of a select few in the first place. That industry is dying ever so slowly, and it's not a bubble. It's not even a rebellion. It's just the free market recognizing money, Bitcoin, is just available for a whole lot less than they know it's worth. Section 4 primarily takes the assumptions made in Section 3 to create this death by variables set of charts that says this vaguely defined early birds group will end up with 65% of the total purchasing power and benefit from Bitcoin's maturation, leaving the latecomers to share the remaining 35%. And based on that analysis, they hit us with this now famous royal decree. Quote, we show that even a Bitcoin positive scenario in which the Bitcoin price continues to rise and the bubble diagnosed by critics does not burst is problematic from a social perspective. And all the wealth effects enjoyed by the early adopters through the rising prices would be at the expense of the latecomers or non-holders who are impoverished. Impoverished. So in other words, they hope that you also find it unfair that the top 1% of the world's wealth, which owns 40 to 50% of everything, was late to discover Bitcoin, and they shouldn't be. So in 2012, it was money for criminals. In 2016, it was too volatile. In 2020, 2021, it was bad for the environment. And now in 2024, rich and famous doctors, oh, I'm sorry, doctor professors, who work for the European Central Bank say it's 
unfair that they were late to the party. What will they think of next? Quote, even if the latecomer cannot attribute their loss of purchasing power, they will feel a malaise and frustration that will contribute to a further and ever more split society. My good doctor professor, you are literally describing our society right now. The one you created to maintain your economic sovereignty. You've kept the public generally numb to their destruction and you don't want Bitcoin's hardness to shine a light on your diabolical scheme. You will allow tech companies to prosper because you have control over them. No one feels threatened by the value proposition of dead precious metals because you control that as well. Now, there's going to be other rebuttals to this ECB paper from people with more degrees than me, from people with fewer degrees than me, but none of that matters. The best answer to this ECB realization of the imminent great wealth transfer is to laugh, quickly identify their lies, and watch another day pass where them and millions of others pray to their fiat false gods that Bitcoin disappears because they didn't find it first. Oh, and while they're tripping out, just buy a little bit more of Bitcoin for yourself. I am Sir Ulrich, like my father before me. Don't sacrifice your future for central bankers. They don't have the same incentives as you.